Welcome to lecture number six and chapter number six, Threats and Vulnerabilities. You can find this chapter in pages 135 to 174 of your textbook. So same agenda as we typically have. First I'll review the last lecture and chapter. Then I'll get into what the objectives of this lecture and chapter are. Then I'll go into this actual lecture for this chapter and I'll conclude with uh, review questions for this chapter. So in the last lecture, what we talked about, we talked about assets. We remember the information security model, which has four components, assets, vulnerabilities, controls, and threats. And we really took a deep dive into what assets are. We talked about the five major categories of assets, whether it be hardware assets, software assets, and so on. And we also provided examples of each asset, of assets in each category. We also defined what asset criticality and sensitivity is and how we can use those particular ratings in rating those particular assets on our networks. Additionally, we summarized the asset lifecycle. This included the procurement of assets all the way up until the retirement of assets. In this, in this lecture, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take another look at the information security model. So we talked about assets in the previous lecture, and specifically information assets, the different types of assets that are available and how they're located within IT systems. But what we're gonna do is that we're going to talk, start to take a look at uh, two other components of the information security model, specifically those of vulnerabilities and threats. What we're going to do is we're going to define each of those and then we're also going to summarize the categories of each. For vulnerability scanners, I've gone ahead and I've gone ahead and uh, taken a deeper look beyond what's provided in the textbook at some of the state of the art tools that are out there that you could use within your organization or that you could present to some of the people within your organization if you're looking to perform a vulnerability assessment. We'll get into what that is a little bit later on in the lecture. Then we will also talk about the threat model. So what we see here on the right is the overall information security model, but we'll talk about what threats are and what a model is specifically for threats. And we'll summarize each component of it accordingly. So let's get into what vulnerabilities are. So remember that we have these information assets and then they're stored in IT systems. And all IT systems will have some sort of vulnerability associated with it. So vulnerability is weakness in a system that can be exploited. And one key thing I want to point out is that all systems have vulnerabilities. But you can minimize vulnerabilities by using a lighter weight operating system such as Linux. Technology is improving with every release, but products are getting more and more complex. So if you think about your iPhone, think about all of the different components it has in there. It has a camera, it has pictures, it has a recorder, it has of phone capabilities, internet capabilities, Bluetooth capabilities, it has many different apps that it can download and so on. All of those have thousands of lines of code behind it. And as you increase your code base in any particular technology, what you're going to find is that there may, there may be more and more mistakes and vulnerabilities associated with it. If we think about the current climate in which software companies operate, say in Silicon Valley, they're constantly under pressure to innovate and come up with new technologies at a very rapid pace and, and beat their competitors to the punch. Oftentimes security is not the first thing that they think of when they're developing these types of technologies. Rather, it's something that they add on at the end. It's not something that they really think about too much when they're developing their product. Now what happens is that the amount of technology that's coming out and the rapid rate at which it's getting pushed out at and the increasing complexity of it increases the amount of vulnerabilities that you can find within these systems. Beyond these though, there's also human vulnerabilities. So for example, weak passwords and ignorance uh, to security policies. Now what we talked about in previous lectures is that awareness of important vulnerabilities is helpful. So there's a simple classification scheme. There's software vulnerabilities and procedural vulnerabilities. So software vulnerabilities have to do with these software specifically, and it's the error in specification development or configuration of software such that its execution can violate sec the security policy. And procedural vulnerabilities are weaknesses in an organizational of operational methods, which can be used to violate the security policy. And these are the two major categories that we broke it down into. I won't go into much depth in e each one because we uh, talked about it a couple lectures ago. But software vulnerabilities include things like input validation, unverified uploads, cross-site scripting, 
procedural vulnerabilities refer to password procedures. Now, one of the mechanisms that an organization can use to assess their vulnerability landscape, or also their attack surface, as it's also referred to, is what's called vulnerability assessment. Vulnerability assessment is after you've identified the different assets on your network or dif different categories of devices and their owners, vulnerability scanners can be configured to scan for vulnerabilities in these systems. So vulnerability assessment tools, what they'll do is they'll look at all of the IT systems that you have within a particular environment. And these IT systems could be actual computer servers or it could be the software within them and so on. Now what they'll do is that they'll automatically go in and scan these, uh, these systems for vulnerabilities and they'll do it on a large scale, do, do it uh, you know, all automatically. Now the selection and configuration of a scanner depends on the device type and in general there are two different categories of vulnerability assessment tools, multi-purpose and web application. Multi-purpose tools are designed to test the vulnerabilities of various types of devices. So they're not just limited to one kind of device. And these types of devices uh, can go beyond your standard server technologies or your workstations. They could also be mobile devices or uh, industrial control systems or supervisor control and data acquisition systems, which are also known as SCADA. Uh, and they could scan the vulnerabilities associated with those particular devices. Additionally, there are web application vulnerabilities. Many technologies today have some sort of a web interface. They have a web technology that's powering or allows users to get access to the underlying database, as you saw in the previous assignment. So web application scanners will actually test the vulnerabilities that are associated with a particular web application. So we saw that the, uh, in the previous lecture, this, one of the websites is actually vulnerable to SQL injection. So web application scanners will actually scan for those particular types of vulnerabilities. So what I've done here, and this is not going to be tested on the assignment or on the quiz or anything like that, but it's still important to know just the landscape of the different types of tools that exist out there and what their costs are as well as what operating systems they're valuable for and that type of thing. So you can take these slides and you can take it to your upper management and you can talk about possibly buying a vulnerability scanner for your particular organization executing some of these scans to identify the vulnerabilities within your devices. Generally speaking, there's many different vulnerability assessment tools that are out there. So it's making sure that you identify the one that's best for you. However, if I have to offer my suggestion based on my experiences of vulnerability scanners, I strongly recommend Nessus. Nessus is a large scale vulnerability assessment tool with 80,000 plus plugins that's designed to assess various vulnerabilities across a breadth of different devices. OpenVest is also powerful it's similar to Nessus, but it's open source in nature. It's not maintained as well as say so, something as Nessus is. And you can see all of the other vulnerability assessment scanners that are available. Now Nessus is the most mature and well maintained and it's specifically designed for large scale vulnerability assessment. Now Retina, OpenVast, Saint, and QualisGuard are also very popular vulnerability assessment tools, but they're not as well maintained. It's also unknown whether these uh, tools will scale effectively. The reason why scalability is important is because many large organizations will have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of devices, software applications, and machines on their networks. So scalability is absolutely crucial to make sure that as technologies keep get, getting added to an environment, there are mechanisms to assess the vulnerabilities in those technologies appropriately. Now other tools you may want to keep in mind is GFI LandGuard, MBSA, Secunia, and Nipper are all designed for specific systems. They may not be as versatile as Nessus in identifying vulnerabilities across a multitude of different devices. Now, part of the reason why Nessus is so powerful is because it has 80,000 plugins to customize assessments for different device types, such as SCADA, uh, routers, windows, and so on. And what, uh, what I've done is that I've actually scripted it in a way, and I, this is actually a slide I took from, my, uh, from the artificial intelligence lab that I developed. Uh, I've scripted it in a way that I can actually scale all of these vulnerability assessments in a very, very uh, efficient manner. Now, while it's useful to do a multiple, multiple types of uh, vulnerability assessments with, this, with the scanner, 
For web applications, it's recommended to use a web application specific scanner rather than a multi-purpose scanner. And the reason for this is that when you're conducting vulnerability assessments, you want to scan for only the vulnerabilities that you commonly think are going to be associated with a web application. So for example, if I know that I don't have any scientific instruments on my network, or I'm not testing any scientific instruments, but I'm only testing web applications, I want to make sure that I'm selecting a tool that is web application specific. So there's a multitude of web application specific vulnerability assessment tools that exist. Uh, and there's about uh, 19 of them that I reviewed. The only two that really scale in an efficient manner are Burp Suite and NetSparker. And they can assess a multitude of web applications in a scal scalable fashion. And both of the tools can scan for various web specific vulnerabilities, including SQL injection, cross site scripting, which are both forms of software vulnerabilities, buffer overflows, and so on. We've discussed what those different vulnerabilities do in a previous lecture. So Burp Suite will actually allow you to go ahead and scan for those, two, uh, those vulnerabilities accordingly. Now, when you're doing specific scans, you should benchmark the tools against each other based off of their speed, scalability, and accuracy, as well as their, their resource consumption. But other considerations you may want to take into account when selecting a vulnerability scanner is, say, something like cost or resource consumption. So that's really on the vulnerability end. We know a, a multitude of different vulnerabilities that may afflict different systems within an organization. And we know how to go ahead and actually uh, do vulnerability assessments in, in terms of their overall principle, the different types of tools that are available, the, their, their power, and so on. I really strongly encourage you to go into those particular tools and, and really identify their strengths and weaknesses and see how they can benefit your organization. I've also done much research in the area of vulnerability assessment. If you're interested, I can send you some papers on, on some of the vulnerability assessments I've done in my own research. Additionally, you can find some of the papers directly on my website. Now, getting into the second half of the lecture, we're going to talk about threats. So at this point, we've talked about three com two components of the uh, information security model, assets, and also vulnerabilities. But now we need to know the different types of threats that may affect our organization as well as the, how we can model those threats accordingly. So just as a reminder, threats are capabilities, intentions, and attack methods of adversaries to exploit or cause harm to, to information. So for example, someone trying to steal intellectual property, guessing passwords, and so on. Now, in the 80s, uh, this was pranks and malicious intention. The, in 2000, it was disruptive and malicious. And in 2010 and after, it's been primarily profit-seeking, as we can see from many of the different events that we've covered in the previous classes. There's a model for representing threats. And the, it's shown as arrows in the basic model. So remember that uh, there are a multitude of different threats that are out there. So for example, viruses, zombies, DOS, malware, and so on. In the previous few lectures, we talked about those uh, particular vulnerabilities, or I'm sorry, those particular threats and what they specifically do. So we won't reiterate those here. There's also a multitude of different uh, adversaries that could be exploiting those threats against our organization. So how do we actually model these threats? Remember, a model gives a way of looking at key concepts of a phenomena, in this case a threat, and the relationship between those phenomena. So a threat model, the definition of it, is interactions between relevant agents, actions, and assets that, con that constitute a threat model facing an organization. So threats arise from motivated people, agents, or threat actors taking specific actions to exploit assets. To understand threats, we must understand the relevant agents and their motivations. So who are the possible adversaries against our organization? The likely assets to be affected, so we know what the different types of assets are. And the likely actions that they can take against each asset. So these could be the vulnerabilities associated with each asset. So threat agents are the individual uh, organization or group that originates a particular threat action. So there's three different types uh, of threat uh, agents, and, um, and they're mutually ex exclusive, collectively exhaustive categories. So there's external threats, there's internal threat agents, and then there's also partners. 
So external threat agents, that's typically what we've seen as an increase over the recent years. In the past, there's been a lot of internal folks that have been doing damage to particular systems, but in recent years, it's become more and more uh, external threats. External agents are agents outside of the organization with no direct links to the organization itself. So these could be activist groups, auditors, competitors, customers, nature the, itself. So for example, a hurricane coming through, that is an external agent. Former employees, government, cybercrime, and the list goes on and on and on. It could be a best friend that you used to have and they decide to attack your system. So that's an external agent. So external agents, say activist groups, they mix political activism with cybersecurity violations. Governments could be like the Chinese APT hacks, the Stuxnet, cybercrime could be the Nigerian 419 scam, and so on. Internal org agents are people that are linked to the or organization often as employees. And this is people who are currently linked to the organization. And the categories could be internal auditors, help desk, upper management, human resources, janitorial staff, software developers, and systems administrators. Now, I want to point out that not all of the attacks that are conducted by these people are malicious by nature. And in fact, it's quite the contrary. Majority of the attacks that are conducted by these people are not malicious in nature. They just may be due to human error or some sort of procedural vulnerabilities that are associated by the organization. So auditors can co cause damage in the name of compliance. Upper management, there could be a lack of awareness of information security concerns. So maybe reversing in the opposite direction. So they may be the, often be the weakest link within an organization. They may just want something to get done ASAP. So if we think about Silicon Valley, we think about the uh, people that are working there, they're trying to push out as uh, high quality technology as possible, as quickly as possible. They may force exemptions from security policies, and it's up to the rest of the folks within the organizations to follow the wishes of the upper management. Partners could be uh, third parties that are sharing a business relationship with the organization, and categories include cloud service providers, hardware and software vendors, and contractors. So just to reiterate, at this point, we know what threats are, we know what threat models are. Is there an alternate way or an emerging way that we can actually model threats? So a little detour that I want to take in this particular lecture. And this won't be tested on the quiz and this won't be uh, on the assignment either, but I think it's extremely valuable information for you to have. So one of the emerging ways that threats are being modeled within an organization and specifically for what's called cyber threat intelligence, which is formally defined as the uh, identifying emerging threats or key threat actors to enable effective cybersecurity decision making, it's called the diamond model. And the little secret about it is that many cybersecurity employers will ask if you know about the diamond model. They'll ask if you know how to use the diamond model, what the components are, and so on. And I've been to cybersecurity job fairs where employers have asked straight up on the spot, what are the four components of the diamond model? So, you know, the quizzes I ask you, I put, put you on a time limit of 20 minutes uh, and ask you a multitude of questions. You know, those, those are the types of things you'll see when you go out into the job market if you want to get a cybersecurity position, is people will quiz you on the spot. Hey, what's the diamond model? What are the different components of it? And so on. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to cover it. Uh, it's not going to be quiz, but it's still something that's interesting to know. And if you're interested in knowing more about this, please feel free to email me. I can provide you additional slides and papers related to the topic. So diamond modeling was created by Threat Connect, and it's rooted in what's called graph theory, and it allows analysts to illustrate cyber events in a systematic, repeatable manner. And diamonds can be combined into what are called activity groups and linked uh, directly to this, what's called the cyber kill chain. And that will be covered a little bit later on in the lecture. In general, the diamond model has four points to it, the adversary, infrastructure, victim, and capabilities. So each diamond refers to a particular event or a cyber attack, so to speak, of what could potentially happen. So what I'll do is that I'll talk about each component of the uh, diamond model. The adversary is the person that is potentially attacking you. So it could be a Chinese APT group, for example. The infrastructure is the type of infrastructure that they're using to house their capabilities, 
what are their capabilities so it could be their servers for example it could be their workstations it could be USB drives that are that they're using to house their particular uh, exploits capabilities are the specific exploits themselves so for example the malware the the different types of uh, boot kits and that type of thing that they have within a, their uh, grasp that actually give them the capabilities to attack against victims right here and don't worry about all of this other extra stuff right here the dial model goes really deep but I just wanted to give you an overview of what are the different components of it and how they relate in with the course concepts so this is an example right here but I think a more interesting example for those of you who are Star Wars fans this is the incident for the Battle of Yavin, the Death Star destruction. So we can see from the Empire's point of view, Luke Skywalker is the adversary. And his origin is from Tatooine, he has these groups associated with him and so on. The infrastructure that he has is say the Yavin 4 base, the rebel base that's actually coming in, uh, that the rebels are trying to protect. That's the infrastructure that they have and that infrastructure houses a lot of their capabilities, such as proton torpedoes, the lightsaber, blasters, the force, and so on. And the victim, the asset that the victim is trying to protect is the Death Star. So the victim, uh, that's, the, that's the who owns the asset, what the asset is, and so on. So the victim is Emperor Palpatine because he owns the Death Star, and the Death Star is the particular asset or victim asset that's being attacked. So you can get more details about this, but in general, this is how you do diamond modeling for a particular organization. And this is something that I also teach in my cyber threat intelligence class about, hey, if you're an organization, what are the different types of adversaries that you should be aware of? What are the assets that you need to protect? What are the types of capabilities that the adversaries have that could potentially exploit those assets? And what type of infrastructure do they have that could help them house those capabilities which could attack your particular assets or your uh, victims on a network. So what you can do is you can actually do what's uh, linking it to the cyber kill chain and this is just very very brief again this goes deep and you're not going to be quizzed on it. You can actually create multiple diamond models and start linking those together and start to create what are called uh, activity threads or activity groups and link that to the uh, Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. So cyber kill chain is, in general, it's the phases of the cyber attack. It's analyzing a collected attack data uh, where the goal is to catch an attack as early as possible. So the cyber kill chain has seven components. So it's what uh, an attacker would actually use to uh, attack a particular organization. There's a reconnaissance where they'll try to learn about your organization. Weaponization where they'll develop a particular exploit. Delivery where they'll deliver the exploit. Exploitation is when they'll actually use the exploit against your systems. Installation is where they try to gain access into the particular system and gain access into other machines on the network. Command and control is where they command and control all of those uh, devices and all of those systems. And then actions or objectives is actually acting on those particular objectives and, uh, and exfiltrating data or bringing down systems and that type of thing. And this is an example, a, a definition and example of each phase. Now what you can do is you can take the diamond model and actually link the diamond models to each phase of the, uh, of the cyber kill chain. So for example, if there's a reconnaissance diamond model where they're using, say, something like Facebook, right, that's their capability and the victim is maybe, say, the CEO or salesperson and so on. The adversary could be a Chinese APT group and and uh, you know their infrastructure could be their servers that could be put into a dial model at the top and then you can continue all the way down through the kill chain and start to create activity graphs and activity threads and really start to model out the all of the different possibilities that an attacker may use when trying to get access into your system or when trying to actually cause harm to your organization by exploiting the vulnerabilities that are on your network that are associated with the particular assets that are stored within your IT systems. So again, this goes really deep. I'd be happy to give you more material if, you, if you're interested, but again, I'm just trying to provide uh, an, an introductory level of understanding to these concepts. But the most important thing is understanding 
threats and vulnerabilities and how they link with the inf information security model as a whole. So just to, just to go back up to the 30,000 foot level, in this lecture we talked about threats, the threat model, the different types of threat agents that are out there, how they are external, internal, uh, and so on. The different types of threat actions that are available, what vulnerabilities are, what are the different types of vulnerability scanners, their value, and that type of thing. As always, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thanks.